Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, powered by iReport Source, helping you manage safety one episode at a time. With the constant regulatory and workplace culture challenges businesses face, we'll provide you with all the relevant information necessary to achieve a safer, more productive workplace. No management theories, platitudes, or guru speak, just actionable info you can use right away. Now here's your host, the safety pro himself, Blaine Hoffman. Welcome to another episode of the Safety Pro Podcast. This episode, we are going back to basics. We are going to talk about some recommended practices for safety and health programs. Look, we've talked about this often enough on the podcast that you know you should have heard it from time to time if you're a regular listener, but I get a lot of emails, direct messages through LinkedIn, folks asking some questions that really go back to some of these basics that we're going to cover, the basic recommended practices for their safety and health programs. That A lot of us like to think that the problems or issues, deficiencies, et cetera, that we're having are some complex, you know, highbrow issues that we've just not matured into yet. In my experience in dealing with some of these questions and this feedback, and even with the clients that I worked with in the past, it's the basics. You know, we, we've missed something in some basic practices and we just need to address those directly. And I'll give you some examples, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is that establishing a safety and health program is one of the most effective ways to protect your people. You know, these programs, they foster a proactive approach to finding and fixing workplace hazards before they cause injury or illness, right? Instead of responding to or reacting to incidents, you know, managers, supervisors, and workers can work together to identify and solve issues before they occur. And this is what's going to build trust, enhance communication, and and lead to other business improvements like improved productivity, reduced turnover, increased morale, you know, all that other good stuff that we're after, right? It's Get, getting back to basics, whenever somebody has a problem and says, I'm struggling with some, and it's usually cultural, right? It's something with attitude, involvement, participation. I go back to, is there an expectation of some of the activities you wish your workers or supervisors or managers would participate in? And it goes back to, having a basic safety and health program. It should be aimed at, the goal should be to you know, actively participate in workplace activities that lend themselves to identifying and solving problems. And so if your basic written safety and health program doesn't call this out, doesn't you know, specifically require everybody's involvement in certain activities, and we'll get we'll go through some of those, what they should be, then that's where you're probably missing the boat. You're trying to come in after the fact and add something on that isn't there. And that's where you're getting some, could be getting some problems. That, again, that's just one example. But, but of all the questions I get regarding something that's missing in you know, their workplace, it usually goes back to this stuff. Now, who remembers 1989? If you're some of our younger listeners, I would say you were either just born or not born yet. But those who were around in 1989, and I don't mean you were one or two, I mean those of us that remember the year 1989, the Safety and Health Program Management Guidelines that was a uh, blueprint for setting up an effective safety and health management program. 1989. So, you know, a lot of things have changed since then. So we've got, you know, the, the nature of work has evolved and the economy itself uh, shifts from manufacturing to a service-based industry. Uh, now we're seeing manufacturing growing again from uh, fixed to more mobile workforces. Technology has changed. Technology. We have mobile devices, tablets, even laptops and operating systems completely, you know, sprung up out of the ground 
since 19, they didn't exist. So, you know, if I'm using the 1989 playbook, I'm not even going to recommend some sort of digital safety health management system solution, right? Does that make sense? So, you know, we have to look at this a different way and, you know, look at automation of, of work activities, technology, you know, I, I mentioned computers, but robotics, all these things being integrated into our workplaces, they introduce new and different hazards that weren't covered in those guidelines that were published by OSHA in 1989. So we've got some new recommended practices that are based on some of those changes. They also reflect what we've learned from these best-in-class programs like SHARP and VPP, programs like that, that OSHA can get a lot of data from these participants. So, you know, I like what makes them effective. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some of those as well. But in particular, these recommended practices place greater emphasis on involving workers in these processes and that include a more robust program evaluation to help drive continuous improvement. We're also going to stress the need for communication and coordination on work sites that involve more than one employer. So obviously we think of construction with multi-employers with a bunch of subcontractors and different trades, but also at facilities like industrial facilities that rely on contractors to come in daily to get work done for us in these facilities, in these manufacturing plants. You know, you have multiple employers under one roof, and so we need to be able to address those unique situations. And it starts with preparing for those situations from the beginning. So before we jump in, let me give you some quick facts. And this was a study of small employers in Ohio. And what they found was that workers' compensation claims uh, fell dramatically after working with you know, OSHA and s these types of programs to adopt similar approaches that I'm going to cover for you, okay? One is the claims per million dollars of payroll. Claims decreased 88%. 88% by implementing some of the things we're going to talk about, some basic foundational elements of a safety and health program. So, you know, this, these are facts that you can take to upper management to say, hey, look, if we do some of these basic things that are, you know, expected of us, we could see something similar to this. So a decrease in claims per million dollars of payroll of 88%. Average loss time per claim. So of those having claims, the average lost time per claim decreased 87%. The total cost per claim decreased 80%. So clearly we have a direct benefit to the business by implementing some of these basic foundational elements. It can help you avoid indirect costs that result from these workplace incidents. Indirect costs, right? Time lost due to work stopping, to investigations, folks, you know, like yourself, if you're, you're listening, but uh, supervisors being involved in investigation, training and retraining as a result, uh, replacing injured workers, even temporary workers, lost or damaged materials or equipment, machinery, stuff like that. Those indirect costs are usually estimated to be at least, this is a minimum. 2.7 times the direct costs. So the direct costs would be the direct medical claims and compensation, things like that, uh, and lost time for the injured worker that you have to uh, pay out those claims costs that I just mentioned. Uh, you know, multiply the, that cost by, you know, 2.7 on the low end, and you've got some indirect costs that really, really are sending costs soaring and, you know, it's not just about the cost, but look, we've got to be able to sell this idea. We've got to be able to sell the return on the investment for improving or implementing new safety programs. This is very, very important. So each of the recommended practices, you know, will cover a core program element. So I've got an example of steps that you, your workers, can take to establish, implement, maintain, and improve your safety and health program. OSHA also has available for you 
This is a good one. A self-evaluation tool. It's on their recommended practices webpage. I'll put a link in the show notes so that you can track your progress through this journey and assess how fully you have implemented or will implement each of these items I'm going to cover for you. Now, there are seven core elements. They're interrelated, and it's best to view these, you know, as part of an integrated system. So an action taken under one core element can and most likely will affect actions needed under one or more of the other elements. So you can't just do one of these things. It goes back to what I mentioned earlier when I get these these emails and these direct messages of, you know, I wish supervisors would would just be more engaged or I wish well, it's because you're missing one of these. You tried to pick like hazard prevention and control and didn't touch on the required employee participation and management support, you know, enough. You you didn't get into that enough. You didn't tie it to hazard prevention and controls with doing workplace audits or safety inspections. You have it even in your job descriptions, some things for supervisors that are vague, like must support safety efforts. And, you know, I don't, it's some vague stuff. It's not actionable or measurable. So you should write something in there like, you know, supervisors must conduct one weekly safety inspection maintaining a safety score of you know 90% or better i don't know something specific that you can then point to and say hey mr or mrs supervisor you're not participating or supporting our safety program enough and the evidence is that you don't do your safety walks each week you don't hold a, a weekly safety meeting you know, something specific but anyway that's an example i don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole but these seven core elements are interrelated Okay, okay, they have to all be done together. Another quick example, and I think this one this one may hit home to a lot of you. It's sort of another take on you know supervisor participation, but workers have to be trained in reporting procedures and hazard identification techniques in order for them to be you know effective participants, right? So the section education and training, that core element. That supports the worker participation core element. Setting goals, you know, as described under the management leadership core element, will be more effective if you routinely evaluate your progress in meeting those goals under the program evaluation and improve and improvement uh, section there. So you you could see how they all tie together, right? Also, keep in mind one size does not fit all. Okay, every workplace is slightly different. You know, but don't go thinking you're special in that, you know, because of what you make is so unique and different in the marketplace that, uh, you know, you could do certain things that other manufacturers, but, you know, we're different because we make this thing. While one size does not fit all, you're all still in manufacturing. You know, machine guarding is machine guarding, right? That That's the, that's the example I love to give. Um, I love manufacturers that are like, well, Take, for example, med med device. Well, we make medical devices. So, you know, we're not making widgets here. I'm like, no, you're making a metal part from machining, right? That's, I don't care what the end result is, to be honest with you. You're putting stock metal into a machine and you're machining it into a shape or configuration that uh, will end up being your product. So that that's, those are the basics. The hazards associated with those are going to be driven by the material itself, whether it's titanium, aluminum, uh, whether you're heating it up or welding it, cutting fluids you're using, the uh, machine guarding is, you know, the standard is the same. So there's a balance, strike a balance. Don't go down that path of, you know, we're special. One size does not fit all is that's not what that means. Okay. What we're talking about here is that each of these core elements are going to be specific but they're not prescriptive. They can and should be tailored to the needs of each workplace. All right. So your safety and health program can and should evolve. Experimentation, evaluation, and and program modification, they're all part of the process. You should always, you should strive for continuous improvement. And, you know, you're going to face setbacks from time to time. You know, those of us who've been doing this long enough, you know, we've seen that. And what's important is that that you learn from these setbacks is to remain committed to finding out what works best for your organization 
and continue to try different approaches. Also, something else to note is, you know, the recommended practices I'm going to go over, the we're going to em- continuously emphasize the importance of worker participation in the safety and health program. For any program to succeed, okay, workers, they've got to participate in developing and implementing every element of the safety and health program. Remember, because they're interrelated, right? So this emphasis we're going to place on worker participation, that's consistent with the Occupational Safety and Health Act, with various OSHA standards, and even OSHA enforcement policies and procedures, which you know recognize the rights and roles of workers and their representatives in matters of workplace safety and health. So we're going to talk about several action items that rely on perspectives, expertise, and input that can come only from workers. So it's really, it's really important for you to remember that, that employee participation, that piece is critical. All right. What are these core elements? Let's name them. Management leadership. Top management is demonstrating its commitment to continuous improvement in safety and health and and communicates that commitment to workers. Even sets program expectations and responsibilities, not in words or in written form or saying saying these things in meetings, but actually leading by example, participating. So managers at all levels, they make safety and health a core organizational value They establish safety and health goals and objectives that are actually achievable and realistic and and measurable, of course. They provide adequate resources and support for the program. That's key. A budget, hiring people, staffing, you know, safety departments or making consultants available and experts available to their employees and then setting a good example along those lines. The next one, worker participation. Workers and their representatives, they're involved in all aspects of the program. And that includes what I just mentioned, setting goals, identifying and reporting hazards, investigating accidents, and tracking program progress. All workers, including contractors and temporary workers at your sites, they understand their roles and responsibilities under the program, what they need to be uh, effective, and carry those out. Workers are encouraged and they have the means to communicate openly with management to report safety and health concerns without fear of retaliation. And any potential barriers or obstacles to worker participation in the program, you know, those are removed and addressed. The next core element, hazard identification and assessment. You gotta have procedures in place to continually identify workplace hazards and evaluate their risks. Safety and health hazards from Routine, non-routine, and even, God forbid, emergency situations, they're identified and assessed as well. And you got to have an initial assessment of existing hazards and exposures and the control measures, right? Followed by periodic inspections and reassessments to identify new hazards that you may have missed. Any incidents are investigated with the goal of identifying the root causes. And identified hazards are prioritized for control. The next core element, hazard prevention and control. Look, you've got to cooperate to identify and select methods for eliminating, preventing, and controlling workplace hazards. Controls are have to be selected, by the way, according to a hierarchy that uses engineering solutions first, followed by safe work practices, administrative controls, and last but not least, using PPE. You also under hazard prevention and controls, you also uh, have to develop a plan to ensure that any controls identified are implemented. Interim protection is provided when you identify a new hazard that doesn't have prevention or controls in place. And you have to track those prog- that progress and also track the effectiveness of controls that are put in place. You've got to have a complete you know, hazard prevention and control process for this. All right. Education and training, the next core element. All workers trained to understand how the program works, how to carry out the responsibilities that are assigned to them, and that includes supervisors. Employers, managers, supervisors, they all have to receive training 
on safety concepts and their responsibility for protecting workers' rights and responding to workers' reports and concerns when they start coming in. All workers are trained to recognize workplace hazards and to understand the control measures that have been implemented uh, in the previous core element, right? So there's another example how they're interrelated. So education and training, another foundational core element. So the next core element, program evaluation and improvement. Look, you've got to periodically evaluate this program for effectiveness. You've got to be able to monitor performance going forward in real time as you're, as you're going. You've got to verify program implementation, specific aspects of your program that are being implemented. You've got to verify that and identify program shortcomings and opportunities for improvement. You know, you're going to need to be setting up some, you know, metrics, some key performance indicators, some predictive measures, or even leading indicators, as some still refer, refer to those. You know, I like predictive measures. I, I want to be able to predict where we're going to have our next problem, right? And um, our metrics and using a dashboard is going to be effective, is key. So keep that in mind. And last but not least, communication and coordination for host employers, contractors, and even staffing agencies. So this is where we throw in this added layer for multi-employer work sites if you use contractors or staffing or temporary workers, stuff like that. So, you know, host employers, contractors, staffing agencies, they, they commit to providing the same level of safety and health protection to all employees. This is a big one, and it's also one of my most frustrating pet peeves, is I go into a manufacturing site, and the workers are like, yeah, if, if you're a contractor, you can do whatever the heck you want, but if you work here, you've got to do X, Y, Z. And because there is a differential in play, that contractors don't have to follow the same rules. That's what we're talking about here. Host employers have to establish specifications and qualifications for contractors and staffing agencies. You've got to have a way of vetting these contractors before they start working and documenting their training and qualifications. So if you have an electrical contractor coming out to your site, your facility, and let's say it's manufacturing, and they're going to work with a scissor lift, you know, how do you know they've had scissor lift training? And do they have a card? Is there a certificate of training? How do you document that? How are you able to, going forward, as you continue to use these contractors, this contract company, and you have employees, their employees hit your site. How do you check to see if they've already had your orientation in the last three months, four months, you know, especially for medium and large sites? You know, having a way to do that efficiently is key. Before beginning work, host employers, contractors, and staffing agencies, you coordinate on the work planning, the scheduling, and identify and resolve any conflicts that could affect safety or health before work starts. So you've got to have this sort of contractor safety program, this contractor onboarding, and then filling out like what work are you actually going to be doing here so that we can anticipate the impact to our workers as well as the contract workers when it comes to safety. So let's get into each one of these core elements. You know, I mentioned management leadership, right? One of the things you can do under this section is communicate your commitment to a safety and health program. A clear written policy that's going to help you communicate that safety and health is a primary organizational value. It's as important as productivity, profits, you know, product or service quality, and, and customer satisfaction. So how do we do this? Establish a written policy signed by top management describing the organization's commitment to safety and health and pledging to establish and maintain a safe and health, healthy program for workers. That, that's key. Let's commit to this on paper, right? We're going to build on that. We're going to take it off, you know, we're going to take it off paper and put it into action here shortly. But for now, let's just focus on that one thing. You have to communicate the policy to all the workers and also any other relevant parties like contractors, suppliers, vendors, things like that, and visitors. So reinforce management commitment by considering safety and health in all business decisions including contractor and vendor selection, purchasing, and even facility design and modification. So I, this is where a lot of your programs fall short, right? And I'll, I'll get these emails and these, these questions like, hey, we've got these problems. We've got these contractors that get brought in here and they don't know what they're doing. They come in here willy-nilly. And 
well, look, they've got their basic wall hanger, like we call it. They've got the commitment to safety hanging on a wall somewhere or in your manual. It's in the orientation slide for all new hires. You know, we, we wrote it down, right? But then that's where it stopped. So at iReport Source, it's funny, we have a, uh, a customer, the, and I won't name the customer, but he mentioned something very profound. He is the chief operating officer. And uh, he said, look, posters and, and you know, value statements and mission statements are great, but walls don't talk. Right. So you have to take it to this next level. And this is an example of where that's a company that missed this. If, if you're asking or complaining to me that, hey, what do I do? We have a great program, but these contractors come in here. It's because we haven't we haven't closed that that loop. We have to include this foundational element in the selection of our contractors. Contractors should also be visible in operations and set examples by following the same procedures that you expect the workers to follow, our workers to follow. But guess what? So should supervisors. I've been through even high-performing manufacturing sites that, you know, even VPP participants in the sites, this is no, this is the truth. This is no joke. Where somebody from engineering will have to go out to the shop floor to get some measurements on something or check check something and they'll walk out without their safety glasses on and just walk right over there and then go ask a question of some of the operators or another supervisor and then go back into the office and it's like look you know or safety shoes no safety shoes you all have to follow the same procedures okay begin work meetings with a discussion or a review of safety and health indicators that we're tracking and uh, maybe any outstanding safety items on a to-do list a prior priorities list, you know, at I, our work at iReport Source, you know, we tackle these problems, right? We provide these, these dashboards and make it easy for companies to see on one screen what needs to be done today, what safety hazards or concerns are still open, haven't been closed yet, they got reported, and by severity, actually. So whatever system you have or you, you lean towards or you choose to use, it should facilitate this. All right, so that was action item number one, right? Communicate your commitment to a safety and health program. Action item number two under management leadership, define program goals, establish specific goals and objectives. I, I did a whole podcast on this a while ago, so I won't dive too deep into you know how to accomplish this, but go back and listen to that one, okay? That's, you have to do that, okay? Action item number three, Allocate appropriate resources. You've got to provide the resources needed to implement the safety and health program. Right? You can't just write it down, set it there, and then not support it. I see this time and time and time again. There's no budget set up for safety. Even if it's one person, create a cost center for safety. Create a department. Even if it's just a department of one, you need to establish or baseline a budget for this. This is key. Estimate the resources needed to establish and implement the program. Allow time in the worker's schedule for them to fully participate in the program and meet the expectations you wrote and signed. That's another one is we don't allow workers the 15 minutes, you know, a week or in the morning shift meeting, shift change meeting, the five minutes needed to talk about the safety concerns and go to the board and say, hey, you know what happened? last night on the last shift that we need to carry forward and let everybody know about that whole rhythm that you got. We don't allow them the time off their machines to do that. Then it's not going to succeed. You've got to integrate safety and health into the planning and budgeting process and align the budgets with the program needs. I can't stress that enough. You have to do that and provide direct resources to operate and maintain the program and meet the safety and health commitments and pursue your program goals. So whether it's a consultant, whether it's, you know, promoting somebody to handle safety, you know, if you do that, you just got to make sure that they get some formal training in safety program management. Lots of folks out there that I've met that were machinists, pipe fitters, electricians, you know, maintenance, you know, workers would make incredible safety leaders. When I say this, I've been fortunate enough to have come across some of these 
you know, natural leaders in my career in with some of my clients and helping them improve their safety programs. I can tell you just off the top of my head, you know, half a dozen names that, uh, you know, these individuals were in coveralls. And look, when I say this, I don't mean this in a bad way. They were doing, you know, hard days work, honest work, good work, made a good living doing this. So don't, when I say they were in coveralls, I don't mean that in a bad way. What I mean is, you know, they were working a skilled trade. They were doing, you know, what they loved and what they knew how to do. And they volunteered to get involved when I came in as a consultant to help improve the safety culture of this organization's of the of the their organizations and they stepped up and wanted to participate they thought that it was a normal part of everybody's job they had this expectation of hey you know i'm the one standing there at the machines repairing them i need to be involved in the lockout tagout program like intimately you know and i'm i point to them i'm like yes that what what that guy said what that gal did and many of them are now in key safety leadership positions in their organizations as a result of their being proactive, pragmatic about this and seeing that they have something to contribute and they rose to the occasion. They were natural born leaders. And so, but look, you also, you, once, you know, you get to that point, you've got to support them. You have to provide the resources they need to be able to operate and manage this program. So if you hire a safety professional, with formal training and education and experience managing a program, or you want to promote a natural leader within your organization, they're both fine. I, you know, the, just got to provide that support. Okay. Don't forget that part. Action item number four under management leadership, expect performance. Two words, expect performance. Management leads the program effort by establishing roles and responsibilities and providing an open, positive environment that encourages communication about safety and health. And one of the easiest, simplest ways to do this is to roll out a hazard reporting process where every employee is allowed to and encouraged, expected to submit hazard reports when they see something that's not right. Even safety suggestions. I would go even further. I say your organization should accept them being able to submit them anonymously, right? If you truly do care only about finding and fixing hazards before they harm your people, then it won't matter who's submitting them. Some organizations argue and will argue this, sort of this Trojan horse, I call it. Well, we're going to tie it to some incentive program, so we have to know who's submitting hazards because we want to count how many hazards somebody is identifying and we're going to put a quota on it. Be careful. I, I don't know about that. So look, if you have some sort of minimum expectation of all employees to find and fix hazards, that you, what you're going to do eventually is you're going to end up, them, they're going to sandbag. I've seen this, by the way. This is why I'm saying it. I'm not speculating or guessing. They sandbag concerns. They're like, well, it's getting towards the end of the month. I need seven more concerns. You know, I have so many I got to do each week. There's two weeks left in the month, and so I, I need seven more between next week and this week. So I'm only going to submit these three, and the other three I'm going to submit on next Tuesday. So then, boom, I got my weekly quota or something like that. So I've seen that. I've actually had workers tell me that, that, you know, they, their workers, their um, managers, I should say, they expect X number of concerns a week. So they produce them. And Look, I think at first, uh, what you want to do to encourage participation is tie it to an, a temporary incentive program by saying, hey, the most creative safety suggestion maybe is we look and rack, we rack and stack and rate the hazard concerns coming in to severe, moderate, uh, something that's just, hey, FYI or advisory, sort of like what we do at iReport Source with our uh, hierarchy, our reporting process, and then choose the ones that were the most severe and then recognize those, right? So you could still recognize somebody's efforts, but you're not putting a quota on it, but uh, that can get tricky. So look, just expect performance. It's plain and simple. And the way you do that is if somebody is talking about a safety hazard or concern and you have a reporting process, whether it's iReport or, or something else, you turn that process into, you know, sort of your catchphrase. 
Uh, you know, years ago there was, you know, Apple was pushing the App Store when, you know, the iPhones, you know, were gaining in popularity. Yes, I'm old enough to remember a life before iPhones. But their big catchphrase was, there's an app for that. They wanted everybody in their app store, in their ecosystem. So there's an app for that. So you could do the same thing. You can say, well, in this case, it's uh, in iReport uh, source cases. Uh, actually, it's literal. There is an app for that. But, you know, you say, hey, we have a form for that. We have a process for that. We have a report for that. We So when somebody is verbally telling you, a worker saying, oh, oh, hey, I noticed over there such and such. That's awesome. That's a great catch. I'll go over and take a look at it. Meanwhile, do me a favor. Put it in our system. That's how you reinforce that expected performance. It's quite simple. Provide that positive recognition for meeting or exceeding or your safety and health goals that are aimed at preventing injuries and illnesses, okay? Just there's many ways to do that, but do what's best, what fits your culture. Another episode you might want to check out on setting up safety and health incentive programs that succeed, and you can get some tips from that one. Bottom line, establish ways for management and every employee to communicate freely and often about safety and health issues without fear of retaliation. Now, the next element is worker participation. So we have management leadership. Now we have worker participation. So the several action items found in worker participation. Action item number one, encourage workers to participate in the program. That sounds pretty basic, right? Look, by encouraging them to participate, you know, management will signal that it actually values their input. Okay, give workers the necessary time and resources to participate in the program. I touched on that a little bit earlier. Now, remember this. If you require, your program requires worker participation, but management doesn't allow them the time to participate in the first core element, this is, again, how they're interrelated. You're not going to get participation. So if you're lamenting nobody participates in our safety and health program, how do I improve or increase employee participation? Why don't you go back and look at whether or not management is supporting this or expecting it to begin with? And if you have that as an expectation, then maybe there's something about our scheduling structure and the way we've tightened up our schedules and overlap of the the two shifts that it just doesn't lend itself to you know realistic participation even at a minimum level in our safety program. So just keep that in mind. Encourage workers to participate in the program. Maintain an open door policy, all right, that invites workers to talk to managers about safety and health and to make uh, suggestions. Action item number two, encourage workers to report safety and health concerns. We just talked about this in management leadership. But remember, we have to expect, when we said expect performance, this is it. We expect employee participation, worker participation. So I'm not going to rehash that one because a lot of those apply here in this section too, okay? All the things that management and leadership set up in that first core element and in, in expecting performance and then providing the tools and the time and the resources, now you can actually point to the lack of participation and say, you're expected to participate. We've given you everything you need. Let's, let's step it up. Let's find out what's going on here. You can do that by reporting back to workers routinely and frequently about what actions are, have been taken in response to their suggestions or reported concerns. Again, this is built into iReport source, this sort of feedback loop. Every time a supervisor goes in and makes a note or there's some progress in the investigation of an, a near miss or an incident, supervisors make notes, a witness statement goes in and makes a note, you get notified. Whoever, whoever's in that loop gets notified. So, you know, look, provide a way to continuously loop back and update employees about the progress of their concerns and suggestions. Also involve the workers in finding solutions, right? Sometimes they're the closest ones to the problems that, you know, they may have a good answer. So make sure you include them. Action item number three for worker participation, give workers access to safety and health information. Look, I don't know how many times I go into a facility and I say, hey, where's your safety manual? Where do you find your HASCOM manual? Where do they keep these safety data sheets? Oh, they're in the safety office. And guess what? The safety manager works first shift Monday through Friday, and the office is locked on nights and weekends. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to keep, be, it's like I'm beating a dead horse here, but it's what, it's what I do. I can't help talking about it. But whatever system you choose, make sure you have that ability to provide access to procedures, policies, 
safety data sheets, work instructions, and iReport source that's available right there on the phone or at a workstation. They just boom, log in. Everybody has access to it and can look up a lockout tagout procedure for a machine if it, you know, if they're not sure about a process or they haven't, they've, they're trained, but it's been like five or six months since they, they've had to work on that machine. They have that available to them. They can print it out, laminate it, and hang it by the machine so that it's there you know, QR codes to be able to scan a contractor and, and make sure that they've, they're have they qualified to operate that machinery. They have access to the various components of the safety and health program when they need it. So that's key, okay? Give workers access to the safety and health information. Action item number four, involve workers in all aspects of the program. Look, provide opportunities for workers to participate, okay? This includes developing and setting program goals. We talked about reporting hazards and developing solutions, but also analyzing hazards in each step of routine and non-routine jobs, tasks, and processes. We should be assigning them some weekly, you know, monthly safety inspections and audits and where they can go and check off the the areas of note on the inspections. And also as they find things, make some notes, leave some notes in there, some recommended corrective actions that they think would help. Define, they can help define and document safe work practices too. get them involved in, you know, effective, safe work practices. You know, I mentioned developing and revising safety procedures. They can help with this as well. Got to be careful with some of it, but it's, it's effective. Getting them to participate gets them to own this. It also gets them to understand why we need some of these things. Some of them, it's just regulatory driven, but you know, a lot of times they come out of the, out of the other end by participating in these some of these things with a, a deeper appreciation and understanding of the risks that are involved in their job. They become advocates for your safety program as well. Action item number five for worker participation, remove barriers to participation. We talked about this before under management leadership to, that they have to remove those barriers by setting up, you know, realistic schedules and shifts and giving them the time and resources, you know, make sure that workers from all levels can participate regardless of their skill level, education, or language. So some more uh, repetition here, but it's it's not repetition so much as it's context, illustrating further that these core elements and the actions I'm listing under each core element, they're interrelated. Hazard identification and assessment. All right, let's talk about this. So to identify and assess hazards, employers and workers have to be able to collect and review information about the hazards present or likely to be present in the workplace, conduct initial and periodic workplace inspections, investigate things, incidents, property damage, injuries, illnesses, all that good stuff, right? So for each hazard identified, you have to determine the severity and the likelihood that could result and use this information to prioritize your corrective actions, your sort of prioritize your to-do list, what to work on. If you have an automated system, if you have a digital solution for this, this, it makes it so much easier. So something like iReport Source that allows you to tag a severity rating to this based on that likelihood and, and how, how severe it could be if it were to occur. And then be able to assign those items that you find to key personnel to close. That's, that's key. Okay, so under this section, there's some several actions. One, action one, collect existing information about workplace hazards. So you got to have a way to collect sort of a summary of what you're finding and organize them in, in some way. And action item number two, inspect the workplace for safety hazards. This has to be an expectation set by management and leadership. We have to allow workers time, resources, and, and education to, to actually participate in this third core elements. This is so we're all related. Okay. You see how this is coming together? Action item number three, be able to identify safety and health hazards. Uh, we expect you to identify these and it's going to feed into another core element later, safety and health training. Action item number four, conduct incident investigations. I did another episode on this one as well, so I won't rehash that one. I'm building up such a library of podcasts here. I can, I can actually get through these and, and refer you to some you know, deeper podcast episodes that go, that go into these things. But look, it's, it's key, right? You've got to be able to conduct 
incident investigations, action item number four. And action item number five, identify hazards associated with emergency and non-routine situations. And one, I'm going to throw a last one in here, um, item number six, action item number six. Characterize the nature of the hazards that you identify. You know, identify interim controls and, and prioritize the hazards for control. So assess and understand hazards identified. This information can be used to develop your interim controls. A lot of folks miss this. I love this. This machine guard is loose and falls off. And it's like, oh, we're going to, we're replacing that machine. Okay, when? Next week? Today? Next month? So from this moment to whenever that happens, we still have to address the hazard. What's our interim protection? How are we going to temporarily deal with this? So don't forget that. So throw that one in there. Action item, item number six, interim control measures. You have to be able to identify those as well. Hazard prevention and control. Let's talk about this one real quick. The first action item, identify your control options. Make sure you have standard options that you go to. Look, you can review sources like OSHA standards and, and guidance, industry consensus standards like NIOSH and, and, and ANSI. Keep current on relevant information from your trade or professional associations as well, some of these best practices. But investigate control measures used in other workplaces to determine whether they would be effective at your workplace, okay? So get out of your, your plant a little bit, kind of think outside the box. But, you know, make sure you get input from workers who may be able to suggest and evaluate solutions based on their knowledge of the facility equipment and processes. You may have to bring outside consultants or experts in as well. So that's it. Uh, identify control options available to you is action number one. Action number two, select the appropriate controls. Hierarchy of controls, you know, NIOSH has, has a good hierarchy of controls graphic here. So I'm going to post that in the show notes on the website. It won't be available on the app because it's an image. But if you go to the safetypropodcast.com for this episode, you'll see that graphic in the show notes. So look, Select controls that are most feasible, effective, and permanent based on this hierarchy, okay? Action item number three, develop and update a hazard control plan. This describes how the selected controls will be implemented, okay? It'll address serious hazards first. Interim controls might be necessary. Don't forget that. But the overall goal is to ensure that effective long-term control or elimination of hazards is achieved. So. Develop and update a hazard control plan as a result of your analysis. Action item number four, select controls to protect workers during non-routine operations and emergencies. Sometimes this is done by having them fill out a quick job safety analysis before they start this non-routine task, right? It's tasks that maybe we're not sure we have identified fully or we're just not as familiar with because we don't do them as often. So we have a document where we have assessed this. We can check that job safety analysis, JSA, against the work I'm about to do to make sure I got the right tools set up. I set up the area and protected the area workers and that this task hasn't changed or something new hasn't been introduced since the JSA was developed from the previous you know, time we had to do this work. So there's something quick you can do with that action item. Action item number five, implement selected controls in the workplace. Once hazard prevention and control measures have been identified, they need to be implemented. So this comes back to the first element as well as the second element. So that's leadership and worker involvement. We've got to be able to provide the right resources, management, upper management, you know, like the budget, committing to fixing things, you know, even though it may fiscally hurt, it's something that we're required to do and maintain our, our processes, okay, and our equipment and machinery. So we're committed to that. And then worker participation have to participate in actually, you know, modifying the needed equipment, you know, installing anything that's purchased to deal with these hazards and participate in that process as well. Action item number six, follow up to confirm the controls are effective. You have to go, you know, loop back around. And we talked about this feedback loop of go back around and say, hey, how's that fix working for you? Is it, you know, what's frustrating you about it? What, what gets in your way? Uh, is it working or is it not working? So get that feedback, loop back around, make sure it's in control that you've actually solved the problem you set out to solve. 
education and training. We're coming up on the end here, folks. Stick with me. Education and training, this core element is is critical. It's important, okay? Uh, it provides employers, managers, supervisors with knowledge and skills needed to do their job safely, you know, even avoid creating hazards. So um, it also provides an awareness and understanding of workplace hazards, how to identify, report, and control them. You know, all the elements of your safety and health program, we have to be able to train and educate folks on, right? So the first action, provide program awareness training. They need to understand the program structure, the plans and procedures. You know, having this knowledge, it ensures that everyone can fully participate in developing, implementing, and improving the program. Action item number two, train employers, managers, and supervisors on their roles in the program, that first element. Make sure they fully understand that they are expected to support the safety and health program and then define what that actually means. Action item number three, train workers on their specific roles in the safety and health program. We often jump to this action item. And most employers, it's like new hire orientation and training for workers. And we do very little on the, you know, training the employer and the supervisors. Action item number four, train workers on hazard identification and controls. Look, if you're expecting them to participate in hazard identification and controls, we've got to train them on how to do it. Simple as that. Now, let's get to the next core program element, program evaluation and improvement. And look, we've got to be able to monitor performance and progress. Okay, the first step in monitoring is to define indicators that will help track performance and progress. Then employers, managers, supervisors, and, and even the workers, right, they have to establish and follow procedures to collect, analyze, and review that data. A system like, again, a system like iReport Source with the metrics dashboard, that's, that's hands down probably one of the most beneficial aspects of programs like this is the ability to, once you open it up, it's right there. It's right in front of you. You've got, you know, days since the last incident, number of inspections completed. You, you could see how you're performing you can track lagging indicators, number and severity of injuries and illnesses. So you've got your total case incident rate, your DART rate, things like that. Those are all in the iReport dashboard as well. You can track workers' compensation data, claim costs, rates. And this is powerful. This is where you get the true cost of, you know, safety on your dashboard. It, and But then you can also track leading indicators. Uh, I mentioned number of safety suggestions. I have mentioned the inspections that are getting done. Those things are critical, these activities that we should be engaged in to actually prevent things from happening and improve our safety program. You can track those as well. And they're all in one spot with one click of the mouse on the dashboard. But look, whatever system you have or, or choose to, to do, if you're still running spreadsheets, it's going to be harder for you to do this. It's a lot of manual entry. And that's a lot of time that I'm still going to encourage you to look to invest in a, in a program built for this. But that's a lot of time you're not going to get back, time that you could be spending with workers where the work happens, right? Action item number two, verify that the program is implemented and is operating. So you're going to have to do at a minimum annually, but you're going to have to evaluate the program to ensure it's operating as intended. So you're going to have to do sort of this program review. And you can verify that the core elements of the program have been fully implemented. You can set up an audit for this. No, not an inspection, an audit right? So involve workers in all aspects of the program evaluation as well. You can assign certain supervisors, key aspects of your safety and health program to review, to audit those, to see if they're actually achieving the goal that we set out to achieve. Verify that processes are in place and operating as intended. So action item number three, correct program shortcomings and identify opportunities to improve. So if you do an evaluation, and you find some some gaps, you need to close those gaps. Look, you know, in your digital system, you can assign tasks to key personnel to improve the safety and health management system. You can do some project management assignments, something offline if you don't have the system. An automated system is going to make this so much easier. And this is where you can clearly see the power of a program like iReport. So which is why, you know, I do the work that I do with iReport. But the power of this program 
is immense. It's going to really allow you to focus and laser focus on areas that need improvement and really drive engagement. It takes a lot of the work off of the Safety Pro's desk. It's incredible, right? So look, correct program shortcomings when you identify them. I have a way to do that. And the last core element, multi-employer work sites, right? Let's just touch on this one real quick. I also did an episode on multi-employer works, work site citation policy that OSHA has. That's actually got a lot of good info on how you can more effectively manage contractors, visitors, temp workers at your facility and some of the risks that are associated with, you know, having contractors on your site. But look, before coming on site, contractors and staffing agencies, temp workers, they have to be aware of the types of hazards that may be present in your facility, the procedures or measures that they need to use to avoid or control their exposure to those hazards, how to contact the safety department or managers to report an injury or illness or incident if they have even a safety concern. So you have to establish effective communication just as you would with your workers. It's the same. It's exactly the same. So just imagine a temp worker coming in or a contractor coming in. You have to do the same thing you would as if you just hired them to work full time in your maintenance department. It's the same thing. Now, maybe there it's a contractor that's only going to work there for four hours and you're probably not going to see them for another six months. They're coming to work on some office equipment. You can narrow the scope. You can limit their exposure to some of the hazards. So you can avoid having to train them on some of those specifically by restricting access, by saying, okay, you're only permitted to come into the office area and this entrance is what you use. But in the event of a tornado, severe weather, maybe in the event of a fire, here's our emergency evacuation procedure. You still have to train them and orient them to the environment that they're going to be working in. So don't forget that piece. So look, some of this could be overwhelming. I, the document, the link that I, I have in the show notes will open a document for this that OSHA has provided and explain this so you can, you can go move, work through your program along with this document. It's really helpful. If these recommended practices these core elements and the action items therein, if they appear or sound challenging, I've got some simple steps to get you started. One, set safety and health as a top priority. Two, lead by example. Three, implement a reporting system. Four, provide training. Five, conduct inspections. Six, collect hazard control ideas. Seven, implement hazard controls. Eight, Address emergencies. Nine, seek input on workplace changes. Ten, continuously make improvements. Okay, the, I, I just kind of ran down some 10 easy things to get your program started right there. But, but look, hit the link in the show notes, grab this document, get started. But these core elements, they're critical. Seven core elements, management leadership, worker participation, hazard identification and assessment, hazard prevention and control, education and training, program evaluation and improvement, and communication and coordination for contractors and temp workers. Look, those seven core elements, those are going to make, those are the foundation of your safety and health program. Get started. Go back to basics. If you're struggling with employee participation, you know, morale is down, look at some of the interrelated core elements like management leadership. You know, have we effectively trained them to carry these out? Do we have the tools to do this stuff and track all this? Don't forget these basic foundational elements. Step outside of yourself for a moment and take a holistic view top down of your safety and health program and see, hey, what did we miss? Chances are it's simpler than you think. Shoot me an email. Link is in the show notes or go to the safetypropodcast.com and head to this episode page for more information. And hey, until the next Safety Pro Podcast episode, as always, be safe. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Safety Pro Podcast, powered by iReport Source, the all-in-one digital safety solution. For info on how you can request a free demo on all of the capabilities of iReport Source to streamline your business's safety management system, head over to the safetypropodcast.com. We look forward to helping you manage safety on the next episode of the Safety Pro Podcast.